good evening or, or good morning for Jachin Gua. Uh, on uh, January 13th, the people of Taiwan are going to be electing an executive and a legislature. <coughs> and the uh, political balance uh, in the Taiwan Strait area is conditioned very seriously by the domestic politics in uh, the three um, areas there, the, the United States, Taiwan, and uh, China. So uh, the election is going to be an important uh, factor. Now, what we're going to do, uh, or what I'm going to do, uh, or what the Taiwan Workshop is going to do, is to have three sessions. Uh, we're we're going to have one session tonight where we'll be talking about the um, expectations uh, in uh, Taipei and in uh, Beijing and in Washington of uh, the possible outcomes uh, and the possible impact of the uh, of the elections. We're going to, in another month, uh, when the political parties of Taiwan finally uh, get themselves straightened out and we have candidates, uh, in, a, in another month on January 15th, uh, December 15th, sorry, we'll be doing another session that we'll talk about the uh, candidates and the actual mechanics uh, of the election. And then the Taiwan Study Workshop of the Fairbanks Center uh, will be going uh, to Taiwan in uh, January uh, for the elections. And we'll have a third session uh, about the result of the elections. So this is the first, the opening session uh, in our uh, addressing the uh, question of the Taiwan elections. So, uh, Jia Qingguo, would, would you would you like to go first? No, well, maybe Richard. <laughs> <laughs> you want to? Go? <laughs> All right, we'll, we'll we'll give you that. Waiting. Can can you go? Um. Yeah, I can go first. Since sure, do it. Talk about Taiwan's election. I can start from Taiwan's perspective. <laughs> I guess. Yeah. I don't think we need. Uh, 20 minutes, but um, I will kind of very briefly touch upon what I think about the issue and then and see if there are, you know, we can have more discussion when we have uh, follow up questions. Okay, so, um, all right, everyone, my name is Wei Ting Yan. Uh, I'm assistant professor at Franklin Marshall College in Pennsylvania. And so uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Goldstein, for uh, inviting me to join this panel. And I think he has chosen a perfect timing for this panel because up until yesterday, Taiwan's election has kind of been like stuck in the middle of nowhere because the opposition party have been struggling to negotiate and form a coalition for the for the about the past two months. And so for the past two months, we were only certain about one candidate, and that was the ruling party's candidate, William Lai. And up until yesterday, when I was thinking about what I want to say in the panel, I realized that we were still we were still very unsure if there will be two or three or even four candidates running for the election. But there was a major breakthrough that happened today. And so that's why I think it's a perfect timing to have this panel, because the negotiation uh, uh, led by the former president, Ma ying have finally made some uh, substantial progress. The KMT and the TPP have finally reached a consensus and decided to run together. Even though it is not yet clear who will be the presidential candidate and who will be the vice president candidate, at least they are. They make the decision to form a coalition now. I do believe that there is a li higher likelihood that Hou Youyi will be the presidential candidate and Ko uh, Wenzhou will be the vice president candidate. But we will kind of know for sure when the official announcement is made on Saturday. And so right now, 
right at this point, I think it appears that there will be three candidates. So William Lai from uh, the DPP and one set of candidates from the coalition of the KMT plus the TPP. And we also have Terry, uh, Terry Guo, who is running independently for now. So that's what we have. Because the negotiation, kind of the coalition, was just formed, the integration of the KMT and the TPP, I think, can ha have significant influence on the election. However, I think it may still be too early right now to tell what exactly the impact would be. I feel like it will be more certain once we wait for the dust to settle. And that, I think, uh, will happen in the next couple of weeks. And so I decided that with that said, I still think that there are certain things that uh, we can discuss uh, with regard to the potential impacts of the 2024 election. And so I want to kind of touch upon this on, from three perspectives. One is the potential outcome, uh, the election outcome and its impacts on the relation with the United States and its potential impacts on future relation, uh, Taiwan's future relation with China. And then what might be happening uh, domestically, uh, depending on what the election outcome will be. So first, on Taiwan's electoral outcome and whether that will affect the future of U.S.-Taiwan relation, my general sense is that I do, I believe that regardless of which party comes to power, we shouldn't expect to see any significant change in policy toward the United States. I think Taiwan is likely to continue cooperation with the U uh, United States to enhance its self-defense capacities. And we have been seeing this trajectory moving toward a positive direction over the past few years. And so, and I also think that to maintain peace across the Taiwan Strait, it is mutually beneficial for the United States to also con consistently provide Taiwan with military assistance, you know, following the, the Taiwan Relations Act. Even though we have seen from time to time that the KMT is trying to differentiate itself from the DPP in terms of the policy stance on Taiwan related issue, uh, on, on China related issue, I don't think any of them uh, come out and say explicitly about distancing itself from the United States. And I think uh, both parties in this regard will continue to welcome US support, but we might see the KMT prefer a more low, even low key approach uh, if they do win the presidency. And also I think uh, in terms of the uh, military kind of uh, self-defense capacity, I think we will still see an increasing uh, in the military budget expenditure, regardless of uh, which party uh, will be in the office because it has been clear that the public opinion in Taiwan is supporting Taiwan to increase its self-defense capacity. Uh, and a good example is that a while ago, Hoyo Yi actually tried to propose to shorten the military service from uh, 12 months back to four months again. So we know like recently, President Tsai Ing-wen just decided to extend the military service to 12 months. So Hoyo Yi was trying to propose to cut it back to four months again but immediately backfired because it didn't really get uh, public support. So he retracted that policy. And I think it, it shows that uh, the society is supporting and welcoming increasing military budget and enhan enhancing Taiwan's self-defense uh, capacity. And so in that regard, I think uh, the people in Taiwan will welcome uh, a, continue, a continuation uh, with uh, working with the United States State. And I think because of that, two, both parties will work toward that direction as well. So that's how I view the U.S.-Taiwan uh, relation uh, in the future. So second, if we're talking about the potential electoral outcome and how that will affect uh, a future China-Taiwan relation, uh, well, it depends on who wins the presidency. In my opinion, I think if the DPP wins the office, we can almost certainly expect that things will remain probably the same in the short run, the way like the way it is now. 
we wouldn't see too much change with respect to Taiwan's relationship with China if the DPP wins office. Because since Tsai Ing-wen went into office uh, in 2016, we have been seeing you know, China decreasing or cutting ties with Taiwan in various ways, including examples such as stopping Chinese tourism, you know, tourists coming to Taiwan or trying to convert more of Taiwan's uh, allies to form diplomatic relations with China. And uh, because the DPP does not recognize the 1992 consensus, if they continue to rule, I don't expect uh, much change in the future. However, I think it will be interesting if the DP, uh, sorry, the KMT or the KMT plus the TPP coalition captures the presidency. If the KMT wins the office, I think uh, what it remains to be seen uh, with regard, regard to how they decide to deal with China. So what I mean is that we know that for the longest time, the KMT has been forming its China policy based on the 1992 consensus. And briefly speaking, the 1992 consensus is one China, different interpretation. And so for the, from the KMT's perspective, the interpretation has been the ROC, the Republic of China represent Taiwan, PRC represent the mainland, uh, the two governments, they, they belong to the same country, even though it's not unified yet. And so this has been the official stance of the KMT. But uh, we know that in 2019, you know, on January 2nd, 2019, Xi Jinping had a national speech on Taiwan. And in that national speech, he made it very clear for the first time that he didn't exactly equate that, but he kind of made it very clear that the way he sees the 1992 consensus is the one country, two system framework, which is the framework that's used in, in Hong Kong. And so it was the first time he kind of talked about two things that together, like 1992 consensus and the one country, two system. That was January, 2019. And so after that, we have been seeing what happened in Hong Kong in the past couple of years. And so it's very clear to the Taiwanese people that the one country, two system framework is not what the Taiwanese people want. It is very clear. And so we can imagine that if the KMT wins the presidency again, they will want to resort back to the 1992 consensus. But the key question and the more important question, I think, is to what extent China will allow the KMT's version of the 1992 consensus? I think that is a question up in the air. If China decides or insists that uh, the one country, two system framework should be the interpretation of the 1992 consensus, then it will shrink the space for the KMT. The, so basically will shrink the space the KMT has to na navigate its China relation. And so there are times in which that China right now uh, sometimes would uh, view the ROC in Taiwan as de facto independence and does not allow it. If they insist on this, then it will be up to the KMT to have a counter argument or strategy. Right now, so far, we have not yet seen the KMT come up with a very clear strategy in this regard. If they do win the presidency, uh, I think we kind of have to wait and see uh, what happens uh, with respect to their strategy with China. So that is my second point on uh, the potential outcome and its uh, impacts on future China-Taiwan relation. So the last aspect I kind of want to touch upon is what might be the uh, election outcomes impacts on domestic politics. So uh, the caveat is that this is the one area I think actually with the most uncertainties because it is full of surprise Taiwan's election. Um, I would say in general, the, the election should work more in favor for the KMT for a couple of reasons. First, since Taiwan democratized in 1990, uh, 1996, my, uh, no ruling party has been able to actually win three three terms consecutively. 
And so the uh, the CPP administration uh, has been in office for two terms now. Um, voters in general are ready for a change. And just like, you know, other mature democracies, voters are thinking about having a party turnover in order to enhance check and balance. And if you look at the poll number, you would, it shows at this as well, because it says that more than 50% of the voters say that they would prefer the DPP not to return back to the office. And so I would say that uh, it will work more in favor for the KMT. And now with the coalition forming, it certainly will become a way more close election. But with that being said, exactly because now they're forming a coalition, it may be a civil lining for the DPP. Because now it has, it will, if it goes the way it is, it will become a two party elections again. And if China issue becomes at the center of election again, it actually may motivate voters to, you know, turn out and come out and vote. And that might actually work in favor for the DPP a little bit. Uh, but the more interesting part will be actually that needs to be watched more closely after the election is whether there is a divided government or not. So whether the presidency and the legislative branch are occupied the same party or by different parties, because even if the DPP wins the presidency, it is likely that they will not gain majority in the legislative branch. And if that happens, then we were running a situation in which the president has to decide whether they will nominate uh, a premier that will be endorsed by the majority party in the legislative branch. And so since Taiwan democratized, there were only one example of divided government, and that was the uh, you know, Chen Shui-bian's first term in 2000. And so if it turns out to be a divided government, then it will put Taiwan's domestic politics into an even more uncertain situation because we know that kind of for a divided government to function, it will require more informal norms and informal institutions to operate. And if we think about Taiwan's democracy, relatively speaking, it is still kind of new. Taiwan just had it, its first presidential election in 1996, and we only had our first party turnover in 2000. So we, in this re, in this sense, we don't have that many form, informal institutions in place supporting a divided government to work. So if that does happen, I think uh, the level of some uncertainty it creates may actually uh, hinder the policy making process. And I feel like we will have a better idea a month from now to gauge the likelihood of a divided government uh, in the post-election scenario. Uh, but I don't want to end in a very negative, pessimistic note. I do want to say that, that being said, even if there is a possibility for a divided government, it is not necessarily that no bills will be passed or it will just be a simple explicitly chaotic situation. Uh, two reasons. One, if you actually look at the candidate's policy platform, if you look at Ho Yui's policy platform and his uh, op-ed in foreign affairs since September, you will realize that his policy platform is very, very similar to the platform proposed by William Bly. The main difference they have is the nuclear policy. Other than the nuclear policy, they are very similar, especially with regard to foreign policy. So they might have more in common than you know than we thought. And if that's the case, then we may still expect to see some of the uh, uh, kind of bills that can reach consensus faster to still uh, be uh, put in the, on the floor and be passed. And second, even though uh, Taiwan only had a divided government one time before, Research actually shows that there were same level of bills that were actually passed in the divided government in between 2000 and 2004. And the result, the reason was because different party kind of anticipated a boycott or objection from the other party. They already anticipated this. So when they made the bill, they proposed the bill, they already make compromises before they send the bill into uh, the floor. So that's kind of one, one uh, kind of positive spin of a potential divided government uh, 
uh, that may happen after uh, the 2024 election. But everything kind of remains. We have to wait a little bit uh, until we can have a more certain answer on any of those questions. All right, so thank you. That concludes my remark. Thank you very much. I, I apologize. I forgot to introduce everybody. <laughs> so let me just uh, take a moment to introduce uh, Wei Ting Yen, who, who, who is a professor at Franklin and Marshall College. Uh, Richard Bush, who uh, is Richard Bush. Uh, <laughs> he has served uh, both in government and in academia and uh, is now a uh, you're you're a non-resident fellow of Brookings Institution. That's right. And Jia Qingguo, uh, who is known to many of us, uh, is the uh, former dean of the School of International Affairs at uh, Peking University and is currently a professor there. Qingguo, do you do you want to go now? Yes or no? Okay, no problem. Uh, okay. Uh, well, uh, good morning uh, and good evening. Thank you very much, uh, Steve, for uh, arranging this meeting. And also, it's great to see uh, Richard and uh, great to know uh, uh, waiting. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, I think. Uh, the election, uh, as far as I can get uh, can get it, <laughs> uh, uh, there it's a, a three way uh, election. Uh, uh, but if you uh, add a uh, uh, Guo then it's four way. But uh, the the top the first three, uh, Lai Qingde, Hou Youyi, and uh, Ke Wenzhe, uh, they they they're. Uh, 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 Popular, according to popular poll, uh, they are the most likely to 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 get elected. But among the three, uh, Lai uh, uh, has the greatest chance, uh, according to the polls. Uh, but until uh, yesterday, uh, uh, yesterday uh, the uh, Lai, uh, I mean Hou Hou Yi and Ke Wenzhe. Uh, Finally agreed uh, to uh, uh, have a joint uh, ballot. So, uh, if, if they pull their resources together, then uh, they they have uh, more uh, support uh, than uh, Lai Qingde. So their chance to get elected has increased dramatically. Uh, but who knows? <laughs> election is election. <laughs> a lot of uncertainties. And uh, I think in the days to come, uh, we are going to see a uh, heated uh, uh, competition among the, uh, the 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 three can the, the four candidates, and and also uh, various kinds of efforts uh, efforts to outmaneuver uh, uh, the other party. Uh, but um, who knows? Uh, maybe. Uh, we are going to uh, have, uh, 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 you know, uh, Hou Youyi and Ke Wenzhe, uh, if uh, uh, they can stay together. So what are the implications for cross-strait relations uh, and uh, for, 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 tai, uh, for tai, Taiwan's uh, mainland policy and also cross-strait relations? Uh, I think uh, if uh, Lai is uh, elected, uh, probably we are going to witness more difficulties. Uh, uh, not uh, because uh, that he may push more aggressively for Taiwan independence, but because uh, he had a record. <laughs> and, and also there is deep suspicion on the part of the mainland uh, uh, about him, uh, about his intentions, about what he's going to do. And uh, and then we'll probably the two sides would continue the current level of negative interactions. Uh, uh, so uh, the 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 both sides will be very wary of the other uh, what the other side will do, uh, and uh, cross-strait uh, you know uh, people to people uh, 
relations would uh, be restricted. And also uh, economic relations would be affected. Uh, ACFA probably uh, would be at, the, at stake. Um, so, uh, and, and of course, Lai probably would uh, appeal to the US to help uh, uh, when, when problems uh, occur. And then uh, the U.S. Uh, may feel ob obliged to to support him, and then we have a situation of greater tension uh, uh, in the Ta uh, in the Taiwan Strait. It, but if Ho and uh, Ko Wenzhou elect, uh, elected, uh, I think uh, at the moment uh, if Ho elected, probably the relationship across. Uh, Across the strait, uh, will be uh, the the more predictable is uh, uh, smoother. And Kuenzhou uh, probably would also uh, close to that would be close to that. And but uh, uh, of course, if Guo Taiming has a chance, I think uh, uh, the 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 situation probably would also be uh, quite similar. Uh, and then uh, probably the cross trade uh, people to people exchange uh, would resume faster. And uh, 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 from the Taiwan side, uh, probably it would lift most of the restrictions on people to people exchange. And economic relationship, uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, well, uh, the mainland uh, probably would uh, more like. Uh, more likely to uh, extend uh, the uh, ACFA uh, uh, arrangement. Uh, yeah, but of course, uh, uh, from the ma the mainland probably would not expect uh, <laughs> great changes uh, uh, across the Taiwan Strait, uh, even though uh, even uh, if uh, the 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 uh, Hou Yi, Kou and uh, or or Guo Taiming gets uh, elected, uh, probably uh, a, a more uh, a situation more like the, the situation uh, when Ma Yingjie was in in charge uh, 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 would emerge, and uh, and this uh, probably. Uh, in a way, it would reduce uh, tension across the Taiwan Strait and and also reduce uh, uh, the 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 uh, conflicts between China and the U.S. over Taiwan. Um, as far as uh, uh, China's expectation of the U.S. Uh, is uh, is concerned, I think uh, China uh, hoped that the U.S. Uh, would not support uh, the DPP. Uh, of course, the U.S. government has been saying that uh, we are neutral. Uh, we uh, we don't mess up with uh, uh, internal politics in Taiwan. But uh, there is always the suspicion that that uh, the U.S. Uh, at least on the part of some Chinese, uh, that the U.S. is supporting the DPP, and and also. Um, uh, China hopes that the U.S. Uh, would. Uh, uh, would uh, try uh, not to send the wrong signals uh, uh, to uh, to Taiwan. Uh, in other words, to uh, 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 even uh, when the U.S. does not want a military conflict, but then uh, if it sends wrong signals uh, like supporting Taiwan independence, then uh, uh, the uh, Taiwan uh, independence activists would push for independence, and this would draw uh, the two sides, uh, the, the Taiwan Strait, into a battle zone. Uh, and uh, probably this is, uh, as far as from the Chinese government's perspective, this is not in the U.S. interest either. Um, and uh, also for that purpose, for for that reason. Uh, in part for that reason, uh, the U.S. should reduce its arms sales to Taiwan uh, uh, to make sure that that the the DPP, uh, uh, especially the extremists, the Taiwan independence extremists, would would not uh, take uh, uh, adventures uh, on the part of the Taiwan independence. 
And uh, what's going to happen with uh, 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 the Taiwan's uh, authorities' uh, 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 policy on the mainland? I think, um, well, if if uh, Hou Youyi or Ke Wenzhe or or even uh, Guo Taiming got elected, then uh, probably uh, this, the 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 situation will become more stable in the Taiwan Strait, as I just. Uh, uh, alluded to, uh, but if uh, uh, Lai Qingde comes to power, then uh, probably more instability, uh, more second guessing, uh, and uh, uh, if uh, if the U.S. intervenes, then uh, probably it will be more complicated, and and uh, and uh, this would lead to greater military pressures on the part of the mainland. Uh, against uh, Taiwan, but as long as Taiwan uh, authorities does not seek for Taiwan independence, uh, the real independence, then uh, I think a uh, war uh, over uh, Taiwan is very unlikely. Uh, uh, but uh, one cannot rule out the, the situation that uh, some people uh, are, are uh, uh, irrational enough to. Uh, uh, take the path of Taiwan independence. And also, uh, uh, the situation would be different, as I uh, mentioned, uh, if uh, 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 the other three candidates, uh, one of the other three candidates, uh, you know, uh, won the election, uh, uh, the, the, the cross trade relationship would move somewhat back toward uh, uh, the situation when Ma Yingqiu was in, in, in charge. Uh, so the chance of a military conflict uh, is even less likely. Um, the current situation across the Taiwan Strait, uh, however, uh, you know, people uh, are unhappy <laughs> with uh, the one country, two systems in the Taiwan Strait. The current situation uh, uh, with the Taiwan Strait uh, is to me is a de facto uh, one country's two system arrangement. Okay, uh, as far as the Chinese uh, government is concerned, Taiwan is not a uh, independent territory. Uh, in other words, uh, it has a law uh, um, law against uh, separatism. Uh, uh, you know the the name of that law. Uh, uh, suggests that uh, in in sovereignty terms, Taiwan has never been independent, so it's still part of China. The current uh, division uh, uh, in the Taiwan Strait uh, is a political division, uh, resulting from a civil war, rather than uh, resulting from the successful Taiwan independence. So we have one country, and also uh, the mainland. And the Taiwan uh, practice different political systems and uh, economic systems, and you know different arrangements of uh, um, various kinds of things. Uh, so it's two systems. Uh, it's not a one country two system arrangement uh, uh, formally negotiated between China and another party, uh, but it is uh, 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 like Hong Kong or Macau. Uh, but it is uh, a de facto uh, a situation uh, of one country, two systems, whether uh, people in Taiwan like it or not. Uh, so uh, uh, I think the best uh, Taiwan can do is to uh, seek a better arrangement under this umbrella of one de facto one country, two systems. Uh, it is good for Taiwan, uh, it is good for people on the mainland, and also probably it's also good for the world. We hope that this election will not change that much uh, uh, toward the, in, in, in the direction of conflict. Uh, uh, and, uh, instead, uh, it should change, uh, uh, should make the necessary changes for stabilization and improvement of cross-strait relations uh, in the best interest people uh, of both sides and also of the world. We'll stop here. Thank you very much.
Ingo, thank you very much. Uh, Richard. Yes. <clears throat> thank you very much, Steve. Thank you for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be with uh, Chinguo and Professor Yen in this program. Uh, I'm going to talk about the American perspective on these elections, uh, mainly the views of the U.S. government, uh, but there are other views, of course, and I'll touch on those. Um, allow me to start with a personal anecdote, which I promise uh, is relevant to tonight's discussion. Uh, and I would note that this is a, a special day uh, also because uh, President Biden and President Xi Jinping have just met in California, and we are now getting uh, some reports about the meeting. Um, but my anecdote, um, in December 1999, uh, I was the chairman of the American Institute in Taiwan, and I traveled to Taiwan in that capacity. Uh, at the time, presidential elections were in Taiwan were held in March. So this visit occurred three months before those elections. My purpose was to explain the perspective of the Clinton administration uh, concern, concerning those elections and US policy. Now, this was a complicated time in Taiwan politics. Uh, the candidate of the DPP was Chen Shui-bian. Um, and uh, there's been enough discussion about its approach uh, to Taiwan status. I don't need to repeat it. Uh, but um, uh, at that time, um, it, uh, a move by a DPP government towards de jure independence would have been contrary to um, the position of the U.S. government uh, that we didn't support Taiwan independence. Um, and inconsistent with our abiding interests, quote unquote, in peace and stability in the Taiwan Strait. Uh, Washington at that time took seriously the PRC's warning that it would respond with force to an independence initiative. Uh, meanwhile, the ruling party, the Kuomintang, was divided. Uh, Vice Pe President Lian Zhang was uh, uh, the uh, official KMT candidate and uh, James Song Chuyu, um, who had held a number of positions within the KMT and the ROC government, uh, ended up running as an independent. And um, they uh, ended up splitting the vote, and Chen Shui bian uh, won uh, with a little bit less than 40%. Uh, it was a very competitive race, um, but um, it was a divided race. Um, before the election actually occurred um, in December of 1999, I met with each of the candidates and on instructions from the Clinton administration conveyed a message concerning its attitude toward the election. And this message included several simple points. First of all, the United States took a neutral position on the election. We did not favor one candidate over the others. It was the Taiwan people who should pick their leader and not Washington. Um, second, we would seek to work with whoever the people of Taiwan picked to be their president. Third, what was important to the United States was not who became uh, the president, but the policies of that person and whether they aligned or did not align with U.S. interests uh, concerning Taiwan. Uh, if the interest did align, then there'd be no problem. If there was disagreement or conflict, we would uh, talk about it and try and resolve those differences. Uh, and the implication was that if we couldn't resolve the differences, it would affect our bilateral relationship. Um, at the end of my visit, I publicly met with a group of eager reporters and made essentially the same statement. That way, it would be clear not only to the candidates themselves, but to the Taiwan public what the views of the United States uh, were. Um, and uh, the rest is history. Uh, Chan won with less than a majority, uh, the KMT maintained control of the legislative yuan. For a couple of years, U.S.-Taiwan relations were not bad. Then in uh, late 2002, um, Chen Shui-bian changed his political strategy in ways that the George W. Bush administration found to be inconsistent with U.S. interests, and the relationship suffered. So uh, let us fast forward 24 years. A month ago, Laura Rosenberger, the incumbent chair of AIT, traveled to Taiwan for a visit. This was three months before the 2024 election, 
which is going to be held in January. And her main uh, purpose was to state the US perspective on that contest. Um, and I would say that if anything, the political situation, while it is similar to the one that existed in uh, 2000, uh, was even more complicated than, than it was then. Um, you have heard from Professor Yen about the key actors and the political dynamics. Uh, I think the outcome, outcome is really up for grabs. Um, one question one can ask is, will the KMT TPP coalition actually work? Another, will young people who have supported Koanja desert him and uh, go to the DPP? I have no idea. Uh, these are things that will play out. Now, during um, Ms. Rosenberger's visit, uh, she met with President Tsai and then met privately with each of the officially registered candidates. Towards the end of her visit, uh, she met with reporters to discuss an array of issues, but also Washington's view of the election. And she said the following, uh, America is confident and respectful of Taiwan's transparent democracy and its free and fair election. The United States, quote, does not and will not take sides in Taiwan's free and fair election, unquote. Washington, quote, looks forward to working with whomever uh, Taiwan voters choose as their leader, unquote. And U.S. interests in Taiwan um, and, quote, our deep and abiding interests in peace and stability across the Taiwan Strait will not change. Um, she also repeated a number of elements of U.S. One China policy, including Washington's clear and long-term expectation of the peaceful resolution of cross-strait differences, free from coercion, in a manner that is acceptable to the people of Taiwan. And she urged Beijing not to interfere in the elections. Now, if you detect uh, some similarities between what I said in December 1999 and what Laura Rosenberger said last month, you would not be wrong. Um, and this is not accidental. Um, what each of us said uh, reflects uh, an approach to elections uh, in fellow uh, democracies uh, that the US has um, adopted based on long experience. Um, we accept that people in those democratic systems have agency and that Washington cannot afford to alienate a popular party before it gains power. Um, I uh, can say that I've observed up close how this uh, approach is implemented and um, the US policy is what we say it is. Um, now, looking forward, um, based on these, a couple of these principles, if the um, positive US-Taiwan relationship of the last 15 years will continue as it has, it will depend on the policies of the next Taiwan president, of course, and their consistency with US interests. Um, speaking practically, it will also depend on who America elects as its next president in late 2024. I think you know what I mean. Um, I should note that the US government's approach is not the only uh, American approach. Um, there are other ones. First, there are some scholars uh, in the United States who um, uh, believe that President Tsai has acted in increasingly provocative ways towards China and touched its bottom line or, or gone over it. Um, and that the Trump and Biden administrations have not reined her in. Uh, the Biden administration disagrees with this, this view and believes that President Tsai has been quite restrained. Uh, second, uh, there is an active and vocal Taiwanese American community in America that uh, is pro-independence um, and which I imagine would prefer that the Biden administration take the side of the DPP in this election. Uh, third, I would point to um, Congressman Mike McCall of California. He's the chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. And he's offered the view that the KMT is the PRC's ally and would act uh, in the PRC's interests and against American interests if it came to power. 
Now, returning to U.S. policy, I would note that a couple of implications flow from this stance towards Taiwan's election. First of all, um, the United States government does not prejudge how electoral candidates will govern uh, if they win office. Um, the candidates' past careers and campaign statements are certainly not trivial, um, but they are not the only data points. Politicians can change their views as their careers evolve. Um, they do make pledges in the campaign to get votes, but once in office, they may do something different. Um, American officials are clear-eyed, but as I noted, they must be ready to deal with an election winner about whom they may have had doubts in the past. Second, and following from that, the US government does not set preconditions for its interaction with any party in a democratic system, um, except for a party committed to the use of violence. While maintaining a hard-headed realism, we seek to in engage the leaders of all democratic parties, first and all candidates, first to fully understand their policy views and their consequences, and to make certain that those leaders fully understand the interests of the United States and how they intersect with uh, the candidates' policy views. Um, this has certainly been the case with Taiwan. Thus, Laura Rosenberger described her role as maintaining communications channels with candidates in the presidential election. At her Taipei press conference last month, that she said that the purpose of her meetings uh, during that trip with the designated candidates was to understand their visions for Taiwan and to clarify US priorities and interests. I should emphasize, moreover, um, that Ms. Rosenberger is not the only person involved in this American engagement. Um, much of the work is being done by our able diplomats in Taipei. Uh, this, was, this is as true uh, today as it was in 2000. Actually, it's uh, even more true. Now, the purpose of this engagement of candidates from the U.S. point of view is to shape and deepen the, deepen the thinking of Taiwan leaders, to lay a foundation for effective communication and cooperation with whomever becomes president. Um, I also believe that um, the statements that Ms. Rosenberger conveyed um, have a bearing on what um, Steve posed as the principal focus of this discussion. Uh, the possible impact of these elections on the political environment uh, in Taiwan uh, and the security situation in the area. Allow me to tease out some implications uh, of the U.S. formulation. Um, here, uh, a key variable is how the PRC responds to the election results. Uh, I think we can do this by thinking about um, scenarios that may develop after the inauguration of the new Taiwan president uh, on May 20th next year. And here I'll be uh, paralleling what my colleagues on the panel um, have done. Um, the scenario that will likely animate um, fervid discussions in the media, the blogosphere, and some in the US Congress is that if William Lai wins, Beijing will assume that overtly or, or covertly he will move to de jure independence for Taiwan and that China will then prepare for a preemptive war. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, in my view, this is a cartoon version of Taiwan PRC US relations that has little chance of happening. Whatever lies background, he has moved to a position that suggests that his policies will be in continuity with those of President Tsai. He is not a risk taker the way Chen shui bian was. He no doubt knows that the Taiwan public, um, A, strongly favors peace, and B, understands that moving towards independence would lead to war, and uh, C, uh, it would be a war in which the United States would probably not intervene. Uh, so that induces restraint. Also, one might, might note that the PLA is probably not ready to undertake a major military campaign against Taiwan. The risks involved are high and Xi Jinping faces a number of domestic challenges. 
another highly unlikely uh, scenario that I almost don't have to mention is movement towards unification under China's formula of one country, two systems. On this, the odds are virtually zero, even if uh, Ho Yoi, the KMT candidate, or Ko Wenzhou, the TPP candidate, becomes president. Uh, the public opposition to unification in Taiwan is just too strong. Um, I would also note that as far as people in Taiwan are concerned, there are um, uh, quite a lot of uncertainties about what um, a one China policy or a one country, two systems approach for Taiwan would mean. And I think it's fair that they want to know in advance. So what are the more realistic uh, scenarios? Um, let us assume that the KMT and um, TPP implement their plan for a joint ticket and that um, uh, the ticket wins in January. Uh, would Beijing be more accommodating than it has been to Tsai Ing-wen and instead respond more like it did to Ma ying uh, in 2008? I would certainly hope so um, because the current level of tensions is rather dangerous and the cooling off is in order. Um, I think that uh, Beijing's approach to this government will be better than um, uh, it has been towards Tsai Ing-wen, um, but I'm not sure how likely um, a Ma-type coexistence would be. Um, going back in time, both with both Ma and Tsai, Beijing imposed a precondition that each accept a formula known as the 1992 consensus. Um, Professor Yen has discussed this. Uh, all I should say is that Ma accepted this explicitly and Tsai Ing-wen did so elusively. Beijing chose to cooperate with Ma, but towards uh, Tsai Ing-wen and her administration, it has conducted a campaign of coercion without violence. Um, I'll spare you a theological discussion of the consensus, but simply note that Beijing has never accepted Ma ying public definition of that consensus that it's one country different interpretations. It did tolerate it coming from Ma. Um, the PRC might well have trouble accepting or tolerating how Ho Yoi and Ko Wenzhe talk about the 1992 consensus. Um, Ho has said, quote, that he supports a 1992 consensus that conforms with the Republic of China constitution. Um, there may be a problem in that Beijing re rejects even the existence of the Republic of China. Um, Ko Wenzhe has addressed the 1992 consensus recently in a couple of different ways. In June, he claimed that, quote, China itself has not made clear its definition of the 1992 consensus. Um, in September, he observed that the consensus had been stigmatized in Taiwan and that he would deal with the issue pragmatically and not get stuck in disputes over terminology. So good luck with that. Um, if hypothetically Ko or Ho become president, but neither is willing to meet uh, PRC demands to publicly endorse the 1992 consensus based on its definition, then Beijing may not accept, extend the same kind of cooperation it did during the Ma administration. Um, and it might even apply a, so let's call it a low level of coercion um, uh, towards it. Um, if Vice President Lai is elected president, I think that the most likely scenario will be that the PRC will continue its campaign of coercion without violence and perhaps uh, increasing it a little bit. Uh, to repeat, the purpose of that campaign is to undermine the confidence of the Taiwan people. Now, coming back to the US policy, um, for a long time, the United States has helped make Taiwan more secure by selling arms and providing military training. Uh, China has sought for more than three decades to match and support Taiwan's military power, and it is succeeding. Um, Washington, in turn, is adopting new ways to help Taiwan militarily um, to maintain deterrence. Um, in the past, we were relatively quiet about what we were doing in order to avoid diplomatic problems with Beijing. Um, as I've suggested, uh, coercion without violence has a different objective. 
that is to undermine the confidence of the people in Taiwan about their future. Uh, Washington uh, has come to see Beijing's coercion as contrary and inconsistent with its interest in peace, even though it is free of violence. So if the United States is going to help Taiwan counter this approach, we need to use a wide array of tools, including military tools. Uh, and since the target of coercion is public confidence, logically we need to be a lot more public in talking about um, our support. Um, and that is what has happened actually. Now, to, to close, I've focused completely on the presidential election and possible scenarios that might stem from the results. But there are also elections for all 113 seats of the legislative elections, and the results of those contests will be quite consequential. Um, the consensus view in Taiwan seems to be that the DPP will lose its absolute majority that it has had since 2016, and that the party that gets the most seats will only have a plurality. Um, this means, I believe, that governance in Taiwan will become more difficult than it already is. Passing law legislation will require a lot of negotiations on policy issues within parties, among party caucuses in the legislature, uh, between the legislature and the executive. Um, Professor Yan has noted that uh, it's not impossible to um, um, do uh, uh, to pass bills under those circumstances, but it, it's harder. Um, moreover, if a TPP KMT ticket wins the presidential election, there will probably be sort of intra coalition negotiations that uh, take place. Now, on the one hand, such an outcome is an unsurprising result of Taiwan's democratic system. Um, the uh, a dispersion of power and an increased difficulty uh, to formulate and approve policies appear to reflect the public will to some extent. Yet, I think that Taiwan faces a number of policy challenges, both internal and external, and political parties have not always been able to reach consensus on how to address them. How to cope with China is obviously the most pressing one. These are tough issues to be sure. If they weren't difficult, solutions would have been, been found a long time ago. But because the stakes are so high for Taiwan and its 23 million people, um, I believe that political leaders of all parties will have to work even harder to craft policies that receive broad public support. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, would any of the participants like to comment on uh, views expressed by the other participants? I'll, I'll allow you first go, and then I've got some questions, and I expect we'll get some from, from the audience. But uh, was anything raised that uh, some of you would like to talk more about or challenge? I'm, I'm fine. I'll take a pass. You'll, you'll take a pass. All right. Well, let me let me ask uh, ask Wei Ting. Uh, you, you were talking about div divided government uh, and uh, how that might not have an effect. Uh, but it, as far as mainland policy is concerned, uh, in in Taiwan, that that's in the executive office. Uh, so divided government could very well have uh, a, a real influence on the nature of ta Taiwan's mainland policy, uh, with two different parties uh, attempting to influence it in ways favorable to them. Would you say that? So, okay, so I think um, policies related to mainland China there is, uh, I mean, military policy, foreign policy. I think as I stated in my remarks, I think even if it's a divided government in terms of policy, I guess, military wise toward the, uh, related to US and military capacity, I think there is the public opinion has been clear about uh, increasing Taiwan's self-defense capacity. So I think that will create a constraint for 
how the politicians would interact with each other. On the other hand, I think on the China, specifically China related policy, like Professor Jap talked about, uh, different government may have different economic ties with China. I agree that will, that will be a more complicated situation there. Uh, we kind of observe exactly, uh, then I feel like there was a civil society will play a role as well in this process in terms of like what the relations should be with China. And uh, so I agree with you that I think on specific policy related to China, especially economic and people to people policy, that may be more, uh, it will be more chaotic situation like for debates and the discussion if it's a divided government. But on important issues, I think the public opinion uh, it has been kind of steady in terms of my office has been very automatic in closing, turn it off the light. Uh, sorry. Um, I think we will still see certain level of uh, consistency there. I feel like that they will not move so drastically away from what we say, like median voters preference. So as for example, uh, uh, William Lai, for example, a lot of people worry about his pro-independence stance. And so he has been, people know that the majority of people in Taiwan actually prefer the status quo. And so it kind of has already constrained him and coming out and say publicly that he is going to adhere to what the Tsai Ing Tsai's administration's approach is toward uh, China. So I think on major issues, we will see less of the uh, difference, but on other issues, maybe more so. But kind of echoing what Richard was saying, it really also depends on who wins the presidency. If it's a KMT and TPP, the intra-party coalition, the division, that will be a first that a first time for Taiwan. So I don't even know. There's like too many moving parts if that's the case. And we kind of have to wait until that really plays out to be able to determine or be more precise in terms of what the following outcome would be. Steve? Richard. Um, I would just like to endorse and reaffirm what Professor Yan said about the importance of civil society groups. Uh, Taiwan politics have really changed. And uh, active minorities have been able to have an impact that is that far exceeds the number of people involved. Hmm. Um, and um, there is a, an intolerance of indirect representative government and a, a desire for um, direct democracy. Um, the Sunflower Movement was only the most vivid example of that, but there are lots. And I think uh, the next four years will be uh, you know, a field day for social, civil society movements. Thanks. We have a question from the audience. Uh, at this point in time, what meaningful differences can we expect from KMT TPP for ticket with Co as presidential candidate versus one with Ho as presidential candidate? What are Co and Ho's policy leadership differences and how much will they shine through in a coalition government? Thoughts? I I guess I will take that. At, uh, okay, so first, um, I think there is a higher likelihood that if they do have joint tickets, Ho Yu would be the president, uh, presidential candidate, and Ho Yu will be the vice president candidate. And if that's the case, then uh, I think it will be the KMT stance. But if in a situation in which that Koenjo does turn out to be the presidential candidate, then I think we do not really know what his stance, real stance is, because so far he has been campaigning solely on taking down the TPP. That's like his main slogan. And other than that, he hasn't been very consistent with regard to his policy platform. So he talks a lot, but there's not a lot of policy platform. And because 
most of the conversation and the tension has been about forming coalition. There hasn't been much scrutiny over, you know, uh, debates over the real policy stance. So I think hopefully once this settles, when we do have a, a confirm who are on the tickets and who how many people are running, we will enter. We're we're at what fifty nine days counting down, like within two month period counting down to the election day. So far, there hasn't been much substantive discussions on policy. I'm hoping that we will be able to see that play out a little bit more in the last two months of the election. Um, Steve, if I could add. Yeah. Um, in um, uh, elected government so far, uh, the pattern has been the, the president uh, is the dominant person on the team and the vice president has more of a ceremonial role. If you move into a coalition government context, um, you really have to work out a division of labor and have a more significant role for the vice president. Um, Professor Yan is nodding her head, uh, so I'm glad she agrees. Uh, and I am sure that there has been no discussion of that. They're too busy just trying to get figure out how they're going to pick uh, their candidate. The uh, and um, you know we went for 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 centuries without giving our vice presidents a role. Um, but in this what what may be a new situation, uh, I think it's a necessity. Also, I would only observe that Mayor Ho and Chairman Ka have very different personalities. Um, and that will be a factor. Yeah, uh, I, maybe uh, I want to uh, uh, come in here uh, and say a few words. Uh, 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 maybe the, the, the fact that they have not uh, uh, come up with clear platforms uh, is a good news for uh, working out a coalition <laughs> because after they <laughs> they stressed on uh, uh, they come up with clear platforms then uh, the differences <laughs> may be uh, very visible in public so it's very difficult for them to uh, to work together and now uh, they, since they don't have clear platforms uh, especially on the Kohenjo side then uh, probably this is good news for uh, for the coalition to uh, take place, right? Well, and, and it's fortunate in this case that they have four months between the election and the inauguration uh, to work a lot of this stuff out. And I would simply add to that that uh, Kuwinger, as I have heard him and know him, uh, will be a very, very difficult uh, coalition member. He's, he's not a coalition person. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, that the the personal interaction there is is going to be very interesting. Right, and also on the KMT side, uh, if you uh, read the news, uh, there there are people who, are, who strongly oppose to this kind of coalition. Uh, so uh, we don't know whether ultimately it will work, but. Uh, uh, as, uh, be, before they take a, they, they force this coalition before they take a st strong positions on various kinds of issues. Probably that's that's a uh, good news. <laughs> yeah, K uh, K is un unpredictable, uh, and that's going to be difficult. I think. Probably. Yeah, but I think we will. I mean, the registration day is November twentieth. So, regardless, we will know who will be running. <laughs> After November 20th, yes. So, but from now, we still have six days. And based on how quickly Taiwan politics changes, I would say there might be more surprises waiting for us. Yep. True, true. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, will Beijing ever acknowledge that public opinion in Taiwan towards unification is not a conspiracy? but a genuine and deep formulation that requires a more accommodating policy? Well, I think uh, Beijing uh, uh, definitely uh, recognizes uh, public sentiments uh, in, in the Taiwan uh, uh, 
uh, island. Uh, but at the same time, uh, popular opinions change uh, as situation change. Okay. Uh, they used to be very pro-unification, uh, uni now uh, somewhat pro-status independence and most people are pro uh, status quo uh, and uh, may, uh, who knows uh, in in 20 years or 10 or 20 years uh, they, they will remain uh, they will be uh, uh, you know what kind of situation uh, we are facing so uh, uh, and also uh, I, I think uh, uh, popular opinion of a different uh, of a certain part of your uh, uh, country uh, does not give the people uh, the right to seize uh, the territory from that country. Uh, even uh, that's the case for the U.S. Uh, uh, for the U for a state of the U.S. to split from the Union, you need at least I think three two thirds of the uh, of the Senate uh, or the states to approve. So uh, uh, if we allow. Uh, uh, residents of a particular area of a country to uh, uh, to decide uh, where the territory they live uh, uh, on uh, uh, would become, then the world would be a big mess. <laughs> then, uh, then probably uh, what Russia did <laughs> would be uh, legitimized uh, with Ukraine. Uh -huh. Richard, I've got a question for you. Okay. Uh, you, the um, coercion without violence uh, policy. Yes. Uh, the the last uh, three or four months, uh, there, there's been a real intensification of the integration policy. Uh, mm -hmm. There have been meetings held in Fujian and uh, most provinces and talk of uh, greater business uh, connections and uh, more people-to-people -people relations, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, how do you, or how does China, uh, pursue what's basically a contradictory policy? Uh, on the one hand, coercion without violence, and on the other hand, uh, people's diplomacy trying to make uh, uh, integration more uh, more acceptable to the people of Taiwan and more profitable because you, you're basically canceling all, all of your carrots with your sticks, but you're also undermining your sticks with your carrots. So it, 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 it's a funny dual policy, isn't it, of uh, both integration and coercion without violence? Um, I think you're right. Um, I... I would wager that Beijing, um, first of all, is going to try and cultivate those elements of Taiwan society that it feels are unhappy with uh, the current government and uh, that um, perhaps it can bind them uh, to PRC interests. Um, this uh, would especially be true of of the business community, but my understanding is that the business climate in China for um, all uh, external companies is not getting better, it's getting worse. Right. And I, um, the um, KMT leader of a large corporation um, had his company fined because he gave money to both uh, the KMT and the DPP, which is very common in Taiwan. Um, I think that uh, the um, um, the increasing uh, people to people and uh, a sense of common feelings, what what's sometimes called um, spiritual unification, I think, or um, I, this is uh, an effort to try and uh, address the um, Taiwan identity problem. Um, maybe they feel that Beijing feels that it is not done enough to um, promote a Chinese sense of identity, and and so why not give it a try? But I, um, 
I agree that, you know, when at the, when you're doing uh, coercion without violence at the same time, when you are essentially negating the one country, two systems system in Hong Kong, um, the prospects of success uh, probably aren't great, but uh, that's the card they have to play. Okay. Uh, another question from the audience. Uh, why don't Taiwan youth seem to care that Ko has such an underdeveloped cross-strait policy approach? Is it not a main priority for them or is Ko appealing because of his relaxed approach? What makes Ko's mainland policy uh, attractive to young people? Was it his relaxed approach? That's the question. Uh, so, first of all, it is uh, true that most of Ko's core supporters are young people, and it's actually young, uh, educated male uh, is his core supporters. Like young, like 20 to 29, male, uh, college educated uh, is the profile that he attracts the most. Uh, my understanding is that for a lot of this uh, group of uh, young people, they grew up, remember, they grew up after Taiwan democratized. And they were ruled under the DPP for eight years. So I think it's very, to some extent, it's very reasonable. Like they kind of view all the parties as the same and they feel like they deserve a better, an alternative to existing establishment, like established. So it's, there's a, I would say a, a level of popular sentiment in how current the campaign and attract his voters. Hence, what matters is him as an alternative to the established uh, uh, parties. That is his appeal. So what he really runs on is not the most important factor, I would say, for a lot of uh, his uh, core supporters. So I think it remains, it will, I think Richard pointed out uh, very nicely, it, it's up in the air whether his core supporters would actually store endorse him if he does run a joint ticket with the KMT because he has been campaigning about anti-establishment, choose me for a change, for a better change. I'm not the establishment. So he has been like campaigning on this but he's now joining the establishment. I, 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 uh, well, how that would, you know, play out, whether his core supporters will still support him, I think is, is a big question that we will need to observe. Okay. Uh, another question from the audience. What is the United States red line towards the cross-strait relationship? If coercion without violence will lead to the damage of Taiwan's security or democracy, e.g. sending jets or severe cyber attacks, does that cross the United States red line? Um, well, since it's my uh, concept, um, <laughs> I, I think rhetorically uh, it already has crossed. Because if you read uh, administration speeches, uh, they characterize PRC policy towards Taiwan as coercion. Um, the, now, the, the cleverness of this strategy is that it's without violence. And um, so it, it's harder to oppose um in a um, robust way um it you know there's also um you know how we might um uh challenge it in a governmental way i mean w when it comes to military affairs we have the pentagon and their full-time job is to prepare for war and sometimes they do a good job of it um but um we don't have an agency responsible for opposing coercion. Uh, that really has to be uh, a whole of government process um, and um, getting a, a kind of integrated approach is hard. Um, I, I think the Biden administration has been trying. Um, I mean, this, uh, 
boosting public confidence is also a job for the, the Taiwan government. Um, Taiwan politicians, more than anyone, are, are the ones who have to make the case uh, to uh, Taiwan people why uh, they shouldn't um, sort of give up, basically. Uh, but um, this is a, um, you know, th there is no red line in, on this one. It's, it's sort of pink. Uh, and it's uh, wider than a, a, a military red line. Um, and it's, it's hard to know when Beijing has gone too far. Well, thank you very much. We have to uh, end now. Uh, the next session, as I said, we'll be uh, talking more specifically about the elections and the process of elections. And uh, we may even know who the presidential candidate will be and who the vice presidential candidate will be. In any event, uh, thank you to uh, Professor Yen. Thank you to Richard Bush, Dr. Bush. And thank you to Professor Zhang Jingguo. Zha Jingguo. Yeah. Thank you all. Okay, bye-bye. Yeah, hey, bye-bye. 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 Good to see you, Jingguo. Good to see you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.